The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode number 651 for Sunday, April 2nd, 2017. Dave Hamilton and John F. Braun. They are the geeks that turn us on. Talking Mac and iOS. And Pilot Pete might be the guest. They often speak in terminal. They make it cool if you don't know. Just stick around, you'll understand Just how to enter those commands Dave Hamilton and John F. Braun <laughs> Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab. Intro thanks to Kurt Lee, I believe. Thank you very much for that, Kurt. Mac Geek Gab, of course, the show where you send in your questions, your tips, and your cool stuff found. We take those, we share them. The goal is for each and every one of us to learn at least four new things every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Smile at uh, actually textexpander.com slash geek because we're talking all about Text Expander for Teams this week. We'll talk more about that later. Blue Apron at blueapron.com slash MGG. That's where you go to get your first three meals free. We'll talk about what some of those great meals are. We actually had two of them here this weekend. And Harry's at harrys.com slash MGG. That's where you go to get a free trial of Harry's awesome shaving products for just three bucks shipping. We'll tell you exactly what you get here in Durham, New Hampshire, cleanly shorn. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, with a bit of stubble, oh, I'll probably we'll fix that. Shave off uh, after the show. Oh, there you go. There this you go. John F. Braun. How goes it today, Mr. Braun? Well, again, I'm kind of kind of scruffy. Well, we'll uh, we can get you we can get you straightened out on that. Yeah, but we. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we got an event to go to, so I got to. Uh, yeah, I, I want, I the event. Make a, make, I want to present a good image. The event is Thursday. Today is Sunday, yeah. so I, I feel like we might actually make it. It might. It might. I mean, there's enough time between now and no. There's not enough time. We're never going to clean up enough, John. <laughs> Harry's helps. Don't get me wrong, but we're never going to clean up enough. All right, let's get to uh, let's get to some of these tips here. We've got all kinds of stuff to go through today. Robert writes. Uh, he says. If you install a VPN on your iPhone using the automatic installer slash iOS app that most VPN services provide, it will prompt you and install a VPN profile. And he's right. You have to agree to this. And then it installs it. He says, then in your iOS settings menu on the left hand side will be a new entry called VPN with a slider for on and off. But there is a full VPN profile configuration settings page that is at least partially hidden. To get to it, search for VPN inside the settings app and click on VPN general. For some reason, when you only have one VPN profile installed, this detailed settings screen is hidden away. To make it always visible, just click on add VPN connection and create another dummy profile. He says, I just call mine dummy VPN and type in anything into the fields. Now the VPN entry in the left side of the settings will take you to the detailed screen even by touching it. He says, I find that when the VPN service has a dynamic connection, which you usually want, uh, I need access to the detailed configuration menu to temporarily disable it when I'm doing software updates or other network intensive things. I prefer to use the real iOS VPN setting and not the proprietary front end app of the VPN provider. Very, very, very cool stuff. He says uh, a secondary cool stuff found because of sandbox and iOS security, all VPNs on iOS are not custom code. They are only a VPN profile installed per Apple requirements. The VPN app available from the VPN service is simply a GUI front end that manages the profile settings and handles filling in the same, the name of the VPN server more easily. Uh, th this is all very handy. And, and, and Robert is totally right. Except for all my custom VPNs. And I have several uh, that, and there's the ones that have an app and all that stuff. Uh, he's right. You can, it's much, you can just go into the settings uh, app, the standard iOS settings app, choose the VPN and turn it on and it works. That works for every single VPN that I use, except OpenVPN. 
it will start to connect, but it will never complete a connection if I do it from within the settings app. I have to do it from within the OpenVPN app to have success. Do you find the same thing, John? Yes. Yeah. For <clears throat> L2TP, for SSL VPN, for any of the others, I can do exactly what Robert says. Uh, but for OpenVPN, for some reason, um, and it doesn't matter what my OpenVPN server is, but for OpenVPN, I have to do it this way. Maybe it's something to do with the way they, the, the freely available OpenVPN app builds the profile. I don't know. I don't know. So there you go. Thoughts on this, John, before we move on? More quick tips? No, I'm... Uh, okay. I'm right. looking at my VPN screen, and I got uh, OpenVPN, and I got uh, Speedify in there. Cool. And actually, I should have Tunnel Bear in there, but I don't. Those are the three that I use, personally. Yep. 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 Yeah, I've got... Well, I've actually got three VPNs set up on my disk station right now, so I run... Uh, an L2TP VPN, which is great because it's totally natively supported by iOS. You don't even need, need an app or anything. So I've got that. I've got Spotify's, uh, sorry, Spotify. Why did I say Spotify? Synology's SSL VPN, which is awesome, but only available on their routers, not on their disk stations. But it's great because it tunnels over port 443. So nothing can block it or nothing is likely to block it. And then I have an open VPN set up from my Synology. And then I've got an L2TP set up from my dad. And then I've got Tunnel Bear and, and Speedify as well as my third party VPNs. So it's crazy these days how much we've got. Secure. I know. All right. They're, they're watching. They're watching. Yeah. Sting was right. Um, Steve writes, he says, uh, I'm not sure when this was introduced, but if you go in Sierra, there's a great management storage management tab uh, go to about this mac choose storage and click manage and it brings up a uh, great dialogue with suggestions on how to get more space on your hard drive or ssd so uh and he's right it's i think this is uh i don't think it's new in in sierra 12.4 it's definitely not new i've seen it before but mm -hmm. i think it's i think it's just sierra uh, added this and it's a handy very handy way to see what's uh what's there it's not all inclusive it's not gonna do what like you know omni disk sweeper will do but um but it's pretty good so you know there you go you, use, you ever use this john i've seen it yeah i haven't haven't really done much with it yeah but uh no it's nice that it summarizes what's what's going down totally totally all right uh let's see what uh we have mike with uh with an interesting Little tip. Mike says, uh, I will chastise you. Uh, he say he's going to join you, John, in chastising me for making a less than ideal iCloud password. But when that modal dialog box comes up, there's no way I can enter my password either. And once dismissed, sometimes I don't know how to get it to prompt me again. I have solved this with Universal Clipboard. Now on my iPad, I will go to LastPass and grab my password, then paste it into that modal dialog on the phone. There's a slight delay as iCloud does its thing, but it works great. And I use it all the time. It says I am not running Sierra, but since that also has universal clipboard support, it probably works from your Mac to your iPhone or iPad as well. You're, you're totally right, Mike, um, that, that this will work. But here's the problem Two, twofold. Number one, you need to have a second device that supports universal clipboard within arm's reach, which I don't always have when I'm out and about. It's usually just my phone. And then secondly, if in the in the scenario that we just described last week, I had changed my iCloud password. So without being so my my phone that was prompting me for it wasn't logged into iCloud. Therefore, I don't think would have gotten universal clipboard from a device that was logged in. So catch 22. I don't know. I, there's no simple answer. But be careful if you're using LastPass. They've got a problem right now. Be careful. What's their problem? Didn't they have some kind of a security breach or something? Not a, not a breach, but um, a... a um, I read an article where a security researcher said that they found some way that they were able to compromise. It wasn't very specific, so I, I didn't take it too seriously. Okay. Okay. And that when I see, uh, I don't know, the, personally, when I see articles and they're like, well, somebody found an exploit, a theoretical exploit, for right. blah, blah. I'm like, okay. And... <laughs> yeah. Um, 
It's, I don't know. Uh, so I'm I'm still. So yeah, that's the, the extent of the research pretty, that I did. Ars Technica is pretty pretty detailed about it. It says the flaw which affects the latest version of the one of the LastPass browser extension was. Um, uh, let's see. When people have LastPass binary running, the vulnerability allows malicious websites to execute code of their choice. So it's not that your passwords are necessarily corrupt. It's that there's this hole. Okay. Um, that allows, you know, people to do nefarious things. He says, uh, even when the binary isn't present, the flaw can be exploited in a way that lets malicious sites steal passwords from the protected LastPass vault. Okay, so there it is. Ormond, he said they uh, developed proof of concept exploit and sent it to LastPass, LastPass officials. Developers now have three months to patch the hole before Project Zero, Zero discloses technical details. Um, LastPass says it will take a long, or not, no, Tra Tavis Ormandy, a researcher with Google's Project Zero um, vulnerability reporting team, says it will take a long time to fix this properly. It's a major architectural problem. LastPass has 90 days. Uh, no need to scramble. So there you go. All so right. be aware, LastPass users, the clock is ticking. And if it gets to I would say if it gets to 45 days and LastPass hasn't indicated that they have a fix that they're actively testing i'd move you don't want this it's not the it's not the world you want to live in all right or i mean based on what they said uh it's uh it can be exploited by a, a malicious website so just don't go to malicious websites <laughs> well yeah there you go <laughs> right uh-huh <laughs> that's not the point though <laughs> yeah yeah Okay, well, thank you for the uh, yeah. The May there. May first is the date that I would put on that. All of you last past users, it'll probably be fixed by then, or at least they they will have communicated something that that everything's good. But uh, mm. but if we haven't heard anything by May first, uh, my advice is jump ship. So, but you don't have to do that yet. Okay, um, another quick tip that I think is going to lead into some questions here, John, and uh, this quick tip comes from Eric, who says. I have a Mac mini at home, and this is very topical based on some things we've been discussing user. here. He says, I have a Mac mini at home, which is permanently connected to the e to the Internet via Ethernet, but I don't want it to also be connected to Wi-Fi. If I turn Wi-Fi off, then I can't use things like AirDrop. If I keep it on, but tell it to forget the network, that forgetting action syncs over to all my other devices because I have iCloud keychain turned on. He says, I found a solution out of this catch 22 that lets me do exactly what I want in keychain access. Search for the name of your home network. There should be only two that appear one under the system key keychain and one under iCloud it says if there are more than two, look at only the most recent entries, double click on the one in system, then click on the access control tab. You will see airport D and airport under the application access section. Remove both of those and then restart your Mac. It will no longer auto join your home network, but it will still ha let you have Wi-Fi enabled, letting you have full access to things like AirDrop while not affecting any of your other iCloud devices. So this is brilliant because the, the it's still syncing with iCloud keychain. You're just telling your Mac, don't let airport D and airport processes access this password so they can't see it. They can't auto join. To me, that's brilliant. Nice hack. Yeah. Uh huh. That totally solves that problem that we were having. Uh, we were discussing what last week or two weeks ago about the guy who um, wanted to make sure his, his work Mac didn't connect to his uh, home network. But yeah. Brilliant. I, I like it. Very, very good. John, you want to take us to Scott? Scott sent me on a learning journey. Okay. And I'll, uh, Here's what he has to say. So, gents, I don't know who he's writing to here. <laughs> he clearly <laughs> hasn't met us. That's right. Thanks to the competitive world of wireless carriers, there are now affordable family unlimited data plans, and I'm taking advantage of one. It's safer than public Wi-Fi. In fact, I've written an article about this for CSOonline.com. Okay. Um, and doesn't require a VPN because it's natively encrypted. Moreover, it's generally faster than most of the crappy <laughs> public Wi-Fi networks that I've used. True that. Um, no, I'm pretty happy with my public Wi-Fi. <clears throat> uh, anyways, 
Uh, what I'd like to be able to do in order to conveniently capitalize on this limited data plan is to have my iPad connect to my iPhone's hotspot automatically all the time unless I indicate a specific Wi-Fi network. To take priority, it would be analog to a trusted network process in a VPN app. Uh, and he uses Cloak. Uh, and that I would be able to indicate which Wi-Fi networks my iPad should connect to in lieu of my iPhone hotspot. Do you know of any native way within iOS to do this or of any app that would offer either a direct method or workaround. And when he asked that question, I assumed that he meant an app on either iOS or. Uh, sure. Yeah. So OS tell us 10. how, tell us how we would get this done. All right. So I went on a learning journey. So the first thing is I hunted around for, um, I wanted to see if there were any programs out there or apps out there uh, that could help prioritize what networks you connect to. And I did find one, Dave. Um, it doesn't quite solve the problem, though. But I thought I'd mention it because it may solve a problem for some people. It's sure. called Wi-Fi Priority. Okay. And basically what you do with that. So, so what it's doing underneath the covers, and this is what set, set me on a learning journey, is it lets you create a profile and you can specify networks that you want your iOS device to not auto-join. Oh, right. Just like you get, if you're an Xfinity customer, you get a profile that has the, the networks in it and, and instructions on how to connect to them. Right. So at first, I thought that that would do it. But then well, a little more research indicated to me, and you actually had chimed in and, and led me uh, down this path here. Here's the problem, though, is what he's connected. The problem is the way that iOS decides on what wireless network to auto join. How mm -hmm. can you tell how iOS does that? Well, you read this handy dandy support article called how iOS decides which wireless networks to auto join. And as you pointed out to me, here's the bad news. Um, hotspots are at the bottom of the list. Right. So. The thing is, the default behavior, if this thing was broadcasting, if it, if it was a, a access point versus a hotspot, then this would have solved the problem. But it's not. Right. Because it because it appears as an ad hoc network, it is deprior. It is put at the bottom of the list below all other uh, infrastructure networks or, or router networks, whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. But then so taking those two pieces of information, I'm like, hmm, how could I. Well, the, the, the way that Wi-Fi Priority does what it does led me to come up with a solution, though not quite meeting the parameters here. I'm like, oh, creating a profile. Well, what lets you do that? Oh, well, Apple Configurator 2 does, Dave. Oh, wait. Okay. Apple Configurator 2 is a program that lets you create a profile for iOS devices. Uh, and you can bake wi-fi networks into that profile correct so here was my solution so what i did again per you you know what i did was set up my mac as a hotspot okay fine also an ad hoc network so should correct. get close to approximating the, the scenario yeah okay All right so then i set it up as an ad hoc network and then it appeared as a, a network that i could choose from uh, yeah. on my ios device okay but still, because of the priority prioritization rules, um, it would not connect to it by default. Here's how I uh, kind of convinced iOS to do this, though. So when you create a profile, um, a Wi-Fi profile, there are two pieces of information that you provide. One is the name of the access point, whether it be ad hoc or uh, sure. infrastructure. And then there's a little checkbox says auto join and you can either check it or uncheck it. So this is exactly what the Wi-Fi priority guy is doing that wrote that software. Is he, but, but here's the, the problem is, is that if he just went a little further, he would have created a program that could do what, um, right. what a friend needs. Here's what I did is, so I created a profile that had three entries in it. The first entry was my home Wi-Fi network. And okay. so I punched that in and I deselected auto join. Oh, brilliant. So I said, okay, don't join that one. Don't auto join it. Okay. Then I typed in the next one that it typically defaults to, which is optimum Wi-Fi. Um, yep. 
So, so what I did is I took the, the ones that uh, appeared on the list that it knew about, and I basically created a profile saying, ignore these. And then the third entry, Dave, is I entered the name of my hotspot, which was called MacBook Pro, <laughs> for lack of a better, better term. And I clicked the auto join button. Dude. By setting up this profile. See, this was, this was a learning journey. I mean, I went the extra mile here. You understand what this means, John, right? Because what? what I could do is go to my Mac and create a profile th that says Logan Wi-Fi is the Wi-Fi network name and unchecks the auto join thing and put that on my iOS devices, on my, especially my iPhone. I believe that would be enough to convince your phone to, to never, never try to that join again. that stupid thing again. <clears throat> Dude. Yes. Now. The thing is, our friend got back to me and he said, well, you didn't really meet my criteria because I. Have oh, to don't worry about that. This is it. awesome. <laughs> well, he, he, would, he wanted to do it all from his iPhone. He didn't want to have to use a Mac. But uh, OK, yes. But you I, mean, I get that. Sure. When he said app. I'm like, well, you can run. Yeah. Configurator yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. That's an app, but it's an it, OS 10 app. So it, I get there that. is no configurator app for the iPhone or, or now, iPad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, I think if he wanted to roll up his sleeves and it sounds like, you know, mm -hmm. if he's writing stuff online, then he probably can do scripting or programming. The thing is, you know what a profile is, Dave, underneath it all? It's an XML file. Oh, is that right? Oh, so you could... Well, the thing I knew this is because when I was goofing around and creating the profiles, I would highlight the profile. And because I believe it's because I was running default folder, it showed me a preview of the file. And it's and a, a profile is nothing more than an XML file. What's an XML file, you ask? Do you know what HTML is? It's basically a text file with a whole bunch of, uh, with structure to it and tags in it. And that's basically what a profile is. So if you could learn the structure of this profile file that Apple Configurator 2 generates, I bet you you could write yourself maybe a, a workflow. Sure. Well, I mean, just take a look at, you. yeah, take a look at the, um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, maybe workflow, but certainly you could just use a text editor on iOS to do it. The, the trick would be editing it on iOS and then delivering it to your phone in a way that your phone will slurp it in. And that that may be the more difficult trick because you'd have to build it into the app in order for it to like present this profile. Yeah. Or, or maybe email it to yourself. Sometimes if you email yourself a profile, you can click on it and then and then it tries to slurp it in. So that's yeah. pretty good, man. I like that. Now, the other thing is if the Wi-Fi priority guy, if he just tweaked his app just a little bit. So it sounds like anything that he puts in his profile is he defaults it to auto to not auto join. Right. If he made that a choice. Mm. Um, and, you oh, know, yeah. Gonna, and okay. of course, we're you know going to contact. Yeah. Well, the author, yeah, because we mentioned it and say, hey, you know, this may meet the needs of more users. Right. So, uh, so it's a lot of fun. And if. If you want to tweak the behavior of your, I mean, the, uh, Configurator 2 lets you do so many things. I, I think the main purpose of Configurator 2 is like enterprise deployment of things because yeah. you can control all sorts of aspects of an iOS device's behavior. And typically, especially in an enterprise situation, you want to lock down certain behavior. Yep. Uh you know, you may not want to allow people to access certain resources or, yeah, it's a, the, 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 there's tons of things in there. I like it. And, uh, and it makes me happy that it was able to uh, help me uh, solve this problem. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah. No, good find, man. I like it. That's good. <laughs> That's crazy. All righty. Let's um, let's go to uh, let's go to Everett here because Everett asks a question that seems crazy on the surface, but um, but it's really not that crazy. So. Uh, Everett writes on the Mac. He says he has two questions, but really he doesn't think he has two, but he does. He says, what do you use for remote screen sharing? I've been looking for a good solution for my wife who has an iPad air. She needs to remote into her desktop from school in order to access some sites that require flash or some other non iPad friendly plugins. Do you have any good programs or services you prefer she, he says, uh, I tried TeamViewer, but it was too clunky. And she said it didn't work well for her. All right. So it, I'm going to answer your second question uh, first, which is remote login. I really like screens. 
uh, from Adovia that it's got a Mac version and an iOS version. You can build it. You can set it up on your Mac to, to let you come in. It's very, very seamless and streamlined. I, I can't think of a better thing to, to do this with. It's, it, it's a for pay program, but you know, it's, this is one of those scenarios where you get what you pay for. So I like screens a lot, John, um, b- before we move on to the, the next part of his question that he didn't know he was asking, what, do you have any thoughts on, uh, on this? My initial thought was, can't you do this with messages? And the answer, unfortunately, as I started going down that path is no, it seems you can only do it. You can only do screen sharing between Mac OS devices. Right. Well, and also she needs to connect to a machine that, that she's not sitting at. Right. So, right. Yeah. So it, it needs to be, it's, it's actually fairly trivial to do again on iOS. You'd still need an app and I use screens for this, but, uh, but you know, locally on your, like on your home network, it's a little different than having to pierce the firewall, but screens on the Mac will take care of some of that. And, uh, and I think screens is available in set app now. So, um, so that's a, you know, that, that, that service is pretty good. There's some great things in set app. So, um, so that's worth checking out for 10 bucks a month. You get access to a lot of apps. So. You know, the one thing I found, I did find an article that suggested a hack for this and I'll have to look into it more. Yeah. Um, one suggestion was, okay, well connect two Macs to each other, do screen sharing, We've pointed this out in the past, but if you connect an iOS device to a Mac and you run QuickTime Player, that will show what's happening on that iOS device. I didn't verify that this still works. But okay, so see- this is a this is a whole different thing, right? You want to you're talking about showing the content of your iOS device to someone else yes. over a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. D- to- totally different thing, but yes, yeah, yeah. screen sharing with QuickTime Player can do that. Yeah, that's right. That's right because it'll capture it. And QuickTime Player, now that we're off on this tangent, will also let you mm-hmm. capture the uh, screens from your Apple TV. You just got to plug in <sighs> USB to it. So you need, uh, you know, you need a, your Apple TV Gen 4 is a USB-C port. So you need USB-C to whatever your Mac has, which might be USB-C if it's a newer Mac or uh, USB-A if it's, if it's not. So. Mm-hmm. All right. But. Everett asked a dif- different question without knowing it because he said, my wife needs to access sites that require flash from her iPad. And we all know that the iPad doesn't allow you to use flash, except it does via an app. There's a web browser called the Puffin web browser, P-U-F-F-I-N, and it will let you access flash sites from your iPad. So that might be the answer here because, uh, because if that if that gets it done, then you don't even need to worry about it. Have you ever checked this out, John? No, I haven't. Puffin. Puffin. Yeah, like Op- Opus. Opus yeah. is a Puffin, isn't he? Uh, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Or Penguin. Puffin, Penguin. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. But yeah, but, um, yeah it'll let you access Flash. It'll let, it'll let you run shake, Flash content. Or shake your fist at the people that are still doing Flash and tell them to cut it out. Well, there's that. <laughs> right. But in the meantime... Puffin exists. Let's hope Puffin's mm-hmm. existence, at least for that purpose, is limited, but uh, in time. But but it, it does exist. So yeah, it's pretty good because it's using Puffin's servers and all of that stuff. It, it's shifting around. It's not actually running Flash on your on your iPad, but um, but it mm-hmm. is letting you access Flash sites. So there's some there's some. It, it, you're essentially creating a man in the middle situation. So be aware of that uh, uh, because it's not running flash locally. It's just um, it's access. You're accessing the web via Puffin's data centers, but ooh. yeah. Okay. But so let you do it. I mean, it's, the, it's the same thing, right? It's instead of using her computer at work um, via screen sharing and, and that clunky scenario, you get to do it this way, which it's sort of for, you know, it's very specific, Flash content works a lot better. So there you go. But know that, you know, if there's logins and things like that, you are passing them through another set of servers. Pretty good, huh, John? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Uh, You know what I want to do is I want to take a moment and talk about our sponsors. If, uh, if that's okay by you, my friend. 
Of course. Sweet. I will start then with uh, Smile Software's Text Expander for Teams at textexpander.com slash geek. That's where you go to learn all about what uh, what they've prepped for you uh, as a Mac Geek Ab listener this month. But, um, you know, Text Expander is one of these great pieces of software that I can't live without because it lets me create shortcuts to type long bits of text. But it's not just long bits of text. It's long bits of text with, say, a snippet from my clipboard in there. Like John and I, when we're doing these uh, show notes and stuff for Mac Geekab, we have a format that we need to use. And so we just use it. And, and I can type a very special thing from my keyboard. And it takes, if I have the link of a site on my uh, clipboard, it p- puts the link in the, in the format the right way and then positions my cursor so I can type the beauty of text expander for teams is that I could sync that snippet with John. So we're using the exact same snippet. And if something has to change, one of us changes it in text expander. And then that is synced for both of us. Think about this from a customer service standpoint, right? If you've got a bunch of people in your company that are all dealing with the same type of customer facing job, uh, they might have, Uh, snippets, especially if it's email based support, right? A snippet, because that way you don't have to type out. I'm sorry. You know, here's our RMA process, right? You don't want to have to type that out every time you want to be able to just paste that in. So you'd write a snippet for it with text expander for teams. That snippet is now shared amongst everyone. And if you make a change to your RMA process, then all you have to do is change it once. And you know that everyone has it right there. Really, really simple abbreviations for much larger, much more complex pieces of text. You got to check this out. Go to textexpander.com slash geek and check it out. Our thanks to Text Expander and the folks at Smile for uh, sponsoring this episode. Next up is Blue Apron. Blueapron.com slash MGG is where you go to get three meals for free. This is the ingredients for all the meals packed beautifully in this box that comes via FedEx and the instructions for how to make this meal. The last two nights for dinner, we've made Blue Apron meals. We made uh, a great uh, stir fried chicken thing on Friday night and a really, really nice um, like roast beef thing last night. Killer stuff. Yeah, it, it really. And it and the cool part is because it comes with these instructions, everybody in the family can participate at an equal level because we're all sort of operating from the same script and we can all see the script. So it's not like, you know, one of us has the recipe in our head and we're trying to, okay, you do this, you do that, you do this. And no, the piece of paper's right there. Everybody's at an equal level. Everybody just comes in. You got to chop stuff. You got to get this going. You got to get that going. There's things you can do in parallel and help each other. Really, really fun. And then you get this really tasty meal with super fresh ingredients right there to eat. We're constantly surprised with how much we like this because th- some of this stuff, a lot of it is stuff that we don't eat regularly. And that's sort of the point it is it broadens our horizons. But um, yeah, you know, there's there's cashew chicken stir fry with tango mandarins and jasmine rice. Right. I mean, I, like that's a recipe that that's that's uh, mildly complex uh, roasted pork with apple, walnut and farro salad. Right. Udon noodle soup with miso and soft boiled eggs. These are things that I don't know how to make. And yet I'm able to make them meals all cook within about 30 minutes or less. Really, really fun, really easy and great tasting food. So go check it out. Go to blueapron.com slash MGG and you'll get your first three meals free. So can't beat it thanks to blue apron for sponsoring this episode and harry's at harry's.com slash mgg Longtime listeners will know that i am most definitely a harry's convert these blades on these razors are hands down the best razors i've ever used and the thing is they're really really inexpensive it's two bucks a blade Compared to like, you know, four or six bucks that, that you'd pay for it at your pharmacy. And the nice part is this Harry stuff is just delivered to your house and you can get it delivered to your house for free. All you got to do is pay three dollars shipping. Right. So you go to Harry's dot com slash MGG. 
and uh, and you sign up for your free trial, you pay three bucks to have them ship it to you. But that gets you uh, a razor handle, a set of blades on there and shave gel and a travel blade cover. So you're all set to start shaving when this thing arrives. And that's a nice set. Really, the only thing that you then need to get more of eventually down the road is more blades, right? Because that's how it works. As you keep using them, they, they kind of get used up. But <clears throat> along that line, I will tell you, these Harry's blades last longer than any other blades that I've ever tried. For me, certainly. So, you know, not only are they less expensive than the blades I used to use, they actually last longer than the blades I used to use. So uh, it's it's a no brainer, folks. Go to Harry's dot com slash MGG, right? Harry's dot com slash MGG is where you will go to sign up for your free trial. And uh, and like I said, you pay three bucks in shipping and then this thing arrives and you can start shaving with it. I really love this shave gel. It's really, really nice stuff. And uh, and obviously the blades are, as I said, the best ever used. Our thanks to Harry's again, Harry's dot com slash MGG. That's where you got to go. Thanks to Harry's for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, why don't you take it away? You want to, uh, uh, you know what? Let's go to, um, yeah, take it to, take us to Steven, John. Why don't you do that? Steven. Yeah. Where is Steven? Steven, Steven. Ah, here we go. This was a good question. <clears throat> My God, so, so answer. <laughs> uh, no, that's a good uh, answer. We'll help you through it. Yeah. Uh, could you review issues associated with changing of an Apple ID? 11 years ago. Wow. I use my Comcast email address for my Apple, uh, Apple iTunes. I think just Apple ID. Yes, it's an Apple ID. I don't think there's a unique iTunes ID. My well, but it, it was an iTunes ID initially, right? I think. I think he's right. I mean, oh, okay, we're, we're getting into the the you know the nitty gritty. But it's all consul- Yeah, your yeah. Apple ID now is your Apple ID across right. everything. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Um, my neighborhood is being cabled for FiOS. Hey, good for you. I will likely leave Comcast. So should I use my iCloud email as an ID? And I think the other question he's asking is, can, so it sounds like he's going to be retiring the Comcast email address. So I think the question being asked, although it wasn't explicitly asked is, can you change the email address associated with your Apple ID? Oh, because his Comcast email is going to go away. Oh, right. This right. is a real, yeah, this is a, this is a so real So I think issue. that's the question yeah. that he's asking. Now it's kind of relevant because I've been moving away from my ISP's email as well and uh, replacing it when I can with my .Mac uh, email. Right. Because um, yeah, I mean, once you leave your ISP, you're not going to have email with them. Well, you can, but then it'd be silly to keep paying them. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so... You know, I wish somebody had an answer to this question, Dave, but the good news is Apple has an answer to this question. And basically, here are the current rules. So the rules for Apple IDs have changed over the years. Um, Back in the day, I think you actually could have just used a word for the Apple ID, but I think the Apple ID right now has to be an email address. Okay. And basically, in a nutshell, so, you know, there's an article that goes into detail here, but I picked out the uh, important parts. And I verified this. So the thing is, if you use a non-Apple email for your Apple ID, you can change it. You log in and uh, one, so you log in through, uh, you know, the uh, Apple ID site. And when you bring up the, uh, I think it's preferences or something, there's going to be an option somewhere uh, showing the email address being used for the ID. And it's going to say edit. Well, you just go in there, you edit it, and you change it. And then I think what it's going to do is send an email to the new address saying, all right, well, let's just make sure you're not goofing around here and that you actually own this email address, and then it will switch it. Okay? Okay. So that's the answer. Um, an additional answer, though, and Apple has set up this rule, uh, this rule as well, is that if you are using an Apple email for your Apple ID, you cannot change it. Okay, so once you've moved into a Mac.com, me.com, or now iCloud.com address, I guess iCloud's mm-hmm. the only thing you can move into now, although you can keep the, the previous ones, then that's it. You're locked. That's my interpretation of what yeah. the rules say. I think that's right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and, and they and, say there, hey, you can't change it if it's if it's a yeah. So there's what dot me dot Mac and I guess dot iCloud. I still have a dot Mac. That's a, well, kind of a at, legacy at, thing. At Mac. There's no dot. Correct. It's at Mac dot com at me dot com yes. and at iCloud dot com. Yeah. And you can't you can't set up a new account with anything other than at iCloud dot com. Now you don't get me or Mac dot com. That's just for those of us that did it early on. Right. Um, but so for me, it's kind of a vanity address because it shows that I'm like kicking it old school. That's right. But not too old school because dot me is is way old school <laughs> um right. i think dot me came first or no no mac.com came first, mac. com came first and, then, ah, okay. and then it was me i think i'm pretty sure yeah but um the, the the difference here is that if you are using an apple address of one of those three domains we mentioned then presumably your apple id will last as long as your email address right you won't your your apple hosted email isn't dependent on it's really dependent on apple remaining in business right it's not dependent on what isp you happen to be using at that point in time it's a you know it's an agnostic email address from that standpoint you could go and move anywhere and and presumably you'd be able to access it um in fact my guess is even china's firewall lets you access icloud email um because you know they sell a lot of iphones over there so um so that, that's that. And, and of course, that's the issue that we're trying to solve here is he's moving away from Comcast. So he needs to keep his uh, he needs to, to change everything. And and two things about this. Number one, this is why I highly recommend no one use their ISP provided email for anything other than communication with your ISP, because. You have to assume it will go away at some point. Either your ISP will change hands or you will choose to get a better service level. And the last thing you want is to have like this guy, you know, this great choice of Fios and feel like you're hamstrung a little bit because, oh, but if I choose that, I lose my email address uh, and that I've relied on and everybody knows how to contact me there. That's a big problem. And, and they know this, too, if I put on my tinfoil hat for a second. However, David in the chat room or Dave, I should say my, my apologies, Dave Ginsburg in the chat room says uh, my friend moved to Vegas and is now on Cox Comcast. Let him keep his email address. And uh, and other people have said that they've uh, they've they've had that happen too. sometimes Comcast has has forced people to pay for it or made people pay for it. But um but at least there you might be able to call them and there's the option. But if if you're on and relying on your ISP provided email, my advice is change now because you could take six months to change and it probably won't affect you. Right. Uh, but if you wait until you're in that crunch where you have to change, then your time limit is uh, is much tighter. So there you go. That's my that's my rant. Actually, it's not my rant. I have another rant, but. It's unrelated. So I'll leave it at that. Oh, I got a somewhat relevant tangent, but the thing that I've been doing and uh, any decent password manager should let you do this is that um, you may also want to, uh, well, number one, use a password manager, though maybe not LastPass if they don't get their act together. Right. Um, <laughs> we'll see. One thing that you can do typically is search through your database of the sites that you have username and password for. And I've been doing this when possible, or if oh, it's important, yeah. uh, anyone that is using my opt online address, I'm like, you know, let me go to that site and let me change that. And there, there's only one or two sites where they won't let me change the email address to something else. <clears throat> or they won't let me change my username from that, which is kind of aggravating. Most do, though. So. Cool. All right. Uh, all right, let's, um, let's jump around here. Let's, well, let's go to, let's go to Craig. We, we've been talking enough about VPN here that, uh, I think Craig's VPN related question is quite relevant. So Craig asks, he says, I've been enjoying some of the talk recently about security VPNs and Synology really been learning a lot. He says, I've been looking at mobile travel VPN solutions, like the tiny hardware firewall and the black hole cloud. Uh, he says, I have a Synology at home and so could use the Synology VPN as well. Which would be more secure and which would be more reliable? I guess if I am away for a while and my Synology goes down, 
I might lose my VPN access, which is less likely when using a paid service. But if I go to Hong Kong and China, my Synology is less likely to be blocked by their firewall. And on a public Wi-Fi network, how much of a risk is connecting my iPhone to it when initiating a VPN connection? Would disintermediating using something like the tiny hard hardware firewall be more secure? So um, this is where I get to learn something new, because when this question came in, I had no idea what the tiny hardware firewall was. Did you know what this thing was, John? No. Oh, dude. It's this little thing that plugs in via lightning to the bottom of your uh, of your iPhone and uh, it fits on your keychain. Actually, I guess it, it plugs in. Uh, do they have a lightning one? No, they have a USB one. So you have to plug it in. Uh, I guess you got to use an adapter. But um, what it does is it becomes your Internet connection. Right. Um, so, no, OK, sorry, I'm, I'm, I misunderstood this thing. USB is only for power. It's a wireless device. You connect to it. It connects to the uh, Wi-Fi in the coffee shop or whatever it is. And this way, you're never connecting to the Wi-Fi in the coffee shop. And that way, there's not even a split second where you're not connected over your VPN or Tor or whatever it is you want to use. I, I mean, this thing is so crazy. This is, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, it's just it's just built to totally separate you from whatever it is you're connecting to. Pretty good, huh, John? Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I'd never heard of this thing before. So we got to learn more about this. But to uh, to answer Craig's question. Um, yes, you're spot on about Synology being less likely to be blocked in Hong Kong or China because it's not Synology service. It's just their VPN at your home. And based on everything that I've heard, and as I mentioned, I've got some family members traveling to China very soon here. So I've been researching this. Uh, our home IP addresses here in the U.S. are generally not blocked by China's Great Firewall. So, uh, so yeah, running a, a VPN at home is most likely to work, except if, in your case, if you're not there to restart your router or disk station, well, then, you know, the VPN's down. You can't do anything. Um, so, yes, good to have a backup. In fact, I'm even sending my family with backups, even though I'll be here to, to reset things. Uh, but using this tiny hardware firewall on a public Wi-Fi would uh, definitely be more secure because it's never, as we mentioned, never connected to uh, to the your, your Mac is never directly connected to the public Wi-Fi. So uh, so I like that. It's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. We yeah. Gotta, yeah. We got to check this thing out. It's um, let's see it. Uh, the hardware costs are. Um, Somewhere, I don't know, it's hard to say. I think it's like there's an Ethernet one for 35 bucks. Um, one with an external antenna for 41. And then the new little USB powered, I guess maybe they're all USB powered. Uh, but uh, the new little keychain size one called Napoleon is 30 bucks. And um, they... Uh, there's an annual VPN subscription of about a hundred bucks, just, just shy of a hundred bucks, but it says each one comes with an annual VPN subscription. So you might get that for free for the first year. I don't know. So it's pretty cool. You got to check these things out, John. I like this. I love it. We learn new stuff. And then he also talked about uh, black hole cloud. I think that's the company. If I'm not mistaken, that uh, that sells this stuff, but maybe not. I'd never heard of the Black Hole Cloud either. Yeah, Black Hole Cloud is the company that sells the tiny hardware firewall, looks like. And that might be the uh, the service to which you subscribe. So we'll put a link to that in the uh, in the show notes too. Cool, right? <sighs> Crazy. I know. It's good though. You know, I've been running a, a VPN at home for, what, over 10 years and that's actually the reason that I started using uh, DDWRT, the custom firmware, because there was no firmware for a home grade consumer grade router that supported a VPN server. Obviously, that's changed now. And that's part of the reason that I don't find any need to use DDWRT anymore. 
because I can actually get better, easier VPN support out of uh, is certainly out of the Synology router, but um, but also out of, you know, Netgear's routers have a uh, decent VPN. It's limited only to open VPN. You can't do L2TP or, or SSL VPN with those. So the Synology is definitely better, but the um, Netgear open VPN setup is really straightforward. Um, it makes it very, very easy. So an open VPN, I know I've complained about it before, John, because you got to install the app and the profile. It took me about four minutes to get that set up. So I really, yeah, yeah. it's not a biggie. It's just not a biggie. <laughs> well, you know, part of why it was a biggie was to use open VPN on that custom firmware on the third party firmware, DDWRT was a huge thing. I had to do all kinds of stuff in the command line and build the, the certificates and the profile and all that. It's like, ah, I don't have time for that. But when your router takes care of it for you, it's like, yeah, just here's this profile, dum dum. Email it to yourself, launch it in the open VPN app, and you're done. So, yeah. I mean, the hardest part for me was, you know, uh, so I'm running it on my Synology. Yeah. So, one, you can download the certificate. And the hardest part putting it on my iOS device was dragging that certificate file over to the iPhone with iTunes. So the way <laughs> that was the I, biggest pain in the neck, the way I did it was I emailed, I, I tried messaging the certificate to myself and I did, hmm. but it wouldn't I, like from within the messages app on my iPhone, I couldn't <sighs> launch it out, but emailing the certificate to myself, I could, I, I was oh, able, I wonder if it then maps it. Uh, yeah. Okay. It, it, no, it knew it was like, do you want to open this in open VPN? And I was like, yes. <sighs> and then it did. And then there, and then it was like all good. So, yeah, with with the certificates and that's what I was saying before with your with the profile that you create, you, you know, you if, if you could email it to yourself and that would probably be enough to sort of trigger that that process on the on the phone. So it's pretty good, though. Pretty good. Hey, I, I, I need to uh, I need to rant for a second, John. Is that all right by you? Get the get those fists shaking, man, dude. So, um. You know, I've been I've been obviously messing with with all these VPNs. And one of them, as I mentioned earlier, is the Synology SSL VPN, which is great because it connects over port 443, which means even if people are trying to block, you know, open VPN or L2TP or whatever, nobody is going to have a workable Wi-Fi network that blocks outbound connections on port 443 because port 443 is what you use for secure web connections. So there's just nobody in the world that's going to block this. And so Synology has, has built this SSL VPN thing. It's only in their routers, but it's great. And it works like flawlessly. So I set it up and it worked. And then the next day it didn't work. I couldn't connect to it. I'm like, what the heck? You know, like, there's no way. And I tried, even tried connecting from within the house, wouldn't connect. And it, it had the day before, cause it does, uh, you know, WAN port loop back. So you can connect that way and it, you know, it's all good. And I started digging around in the uh, port forwarding section of my router, and I saw that my um, my D-Link webcam, it's a DCS935L. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'll, I'll confirm that, but uh, it's a it's a D-Link webcam. It's a couple years old, HD. I have it aimed at Hector, right? Our parrot, Hector D. Bird on Twitter, right? And uh, and Did so- that public? No. <clears throat> Oh, Definitely not public. No, because it's in my the, kitchen. Miss, I'm not going okay. to publicize the camera Hector that's in my can. kitchen. Yeah. So I'm like, what the heck? So, you know, I, I, I go and, uh, and I look in the, um, it, you know, in the, in the settings for the webcam. And I see that there's a thing in there that says, yeah, um, y you know, uh, UPnP, use UPnP, which is like the auto port forwarding thing. Uh, use UPnP to forward, uh, you know, both no straight web tra traffic port 80 and SSL traffic straight to the camera. But it's turned off. I'm like, OK, well, you shouldn't be doing this. And yet, sure enough, it's doing it. OK, great. Thanks. So I go in and I change it and I tell it to use different ports. Right. I tell it to use 81 and 444. I don't want it to use anything, but it seems intent on doing something. And if I because if I turn off UPnP, it just grabs it. And I made sure the firmware was up to date and all that stuff. So that sort of worked every now and then it would still grab port 80. But and then I had to reboot my router because there's no way to, you know, to do that. So there's no way to remove UPnP things, which I've complained to Synology about. They should let you remove entries. But uh so fine. Okay. So I finally get that sorted out and I feel like 
I've got it straightened out, but it took me, you know, a few days to figure out what it was. And then, and then I had to fix it and jack with it. And I was always worried about if the camera restarted, if it would cause this problem again, because that it would seem to at least some of the time. Like, what the heck D link. Okay, fine. Now, yesterday my power goes out, right? We had a big snowstorm here. Huge snowstorm. We got like a foot of snow or something crazy. And, uh, and so the power goes out. So, when the, when the power's out, you know, I have UPSs on everything because that's what we do, but they start beeping and it went out at 6.15 in the morning. This, this is my one day where I get to sleep in a little bit. And now I've got this UPS in my bedroom waking me up. So I'm awake. So it's obvious the power's going to be out for a little while. Everybody in the neighborhood's out. And and I, I looked on Facebook, one of our neighbors posted that, you know, a tree, a tree limb came down, burned on the wires in front of their house. But, you know, it's fine. It's going to, it's, it's going to be a couple hours. So I go around, I turn off all the UPSs. And, uh, and then I go back to sleep when the power comes back on. Of course, I'm woken up again a couple of, couple hours later because, you know, the lights and things happen. We have like a fan in our bedroom. And so that turns on and that wakes me up like, all right, I'll go around and I'll turn everything on. So. The uh, but the camera's not plugged into a UPS. So I'm turning things on and then I turn on the router. But before I turn on the router, I see that my phone is connected to Wi-Fi. And that's because in the bedroom, I have a, another access point running, but it's not in DHCP mode or anything. It's just an access point, not trying to be a router. I'm like, well, why does it think it's connected to that? There's no DHCP server. It shouldn't work. And I look and my phone is uh, saying that it's got this weird 10.255.255. whatever IP address. What the heck is that coming from? So before I turn on the router again, the real router, I got to figure out what device is handing out IP addresses on my network because I don't want a second DHCP server on my network. And uh, so I get my computer out or I try to log into it from the phone and it just gives me like, you know, username and password. So it's like a, there's something, but I can't tell quite what it is. So I launch my computer and I realize, sure enough, it's the freaking webcam. Why is this thing handing out IP addresses what? on on my network? It it. It, the way you configure this is if it can't connect to another wireless network, it broadcasts its own ad hoc network, right? So you connect to it. It does give you an IP address and that's how you configure the camera and you tell it your Wi-Fi network name and all that. You get to its web interface. That's fine, but it should never be handing out IP addresses on my network. That's insane. So that webcam is now unplugged. Like what the heck? That's insane. Huh. Yeah. So I got to tell how, the people. How again did you determine that it was that? Oh, because I, so my computer or everything that got an address got a 10.255.255.x, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, .107 or whatever it was. But I figured, okay, well, the router, the thing handing out addresses generally is going to be at dot one. So I fired mm -hmm. up a web browser and I went to 10.255.255.1. And sure enough, oh, okay. and it said, log in. And it took a little bit of sleuthing to figure out. And I really didn't even know what I was connecting to. But based on this other problem that I had with this webcam, I'm like, I bet it's a freaking webcam. And so I tried okay. it. And I, I tried the credentials that I had previously set up on the webcam. And all sure right. enough, it's like, yep. Hello. I think the. All right. I, I want to make sure because I was distracted by something. That's OK. Which, yeah. You know, it's not, yeah, it not happens surprising. All yeah. But, um, <laughs> but no, I, I was doing some additional research here. The other way you could have found out that this is happening, I believe. Yeah would have been to do a port scan on that device. That, so and that's what I wanted look, to because do. Because yeah. DHCP, and I just looked this up, DHCP operates on UDP ports 67 and 68, I believe, if the information I have in front of me is correct. Yeah, but it, I mean, I already knew it was handing it. I mean, it was I, like, right. yeah. Like there, I'm no, just saying there was in no general, question. if you want to determine if something is doing DHCP, you could see if either UDP port 67 or 68 is open. Right. The response. If it really, does, then really that's what a was, DHCP server. What was more important to me, which I, I, I had a little trouble sorting out, was what other devices exist on this subnet. Because I'm about yeah. to turn my normal router on, but I don't know how long of a lease this stupid webcam has given to all these other devices that are out there. And so... Like what's going to happen to the, like my Drobo that's already on my disk station that's already on, you know, they, they all have 10.255 addresses. How, how, what devices are they? I just wanted to know what they were so I could try and log in and, and fix them. 
And there's no way anymore in the OS 10 GUI to do a, a ping of a range of IPs. There used to be, but there doesn't seem to be any more in network utility, at least not in the Sierra build that I have on my laptop. Yeah. So well, I, you could ping, I'm pretty sure you could ping the .255 address. I believe that's oh, a broadcast ping. Duh. Right? That's what I should have done. See? I, I was educated. Yeah. I took I took networking. Yeah, I remember no, that was one fun that's what thing. I done. Yeah, as far as as far as I know, uh, pinging a dot two five five address says ping totally. every everybody on this subnet. Yeah, that's what I should have done. Duh. Well, hey, yeah. hey, we all learned something. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that totally would have done it. Yep. <laughs> oh well. Yeah, that would have been the right thing. So that there's the trick. Yeah, because I it took me a better part of the day. It was like, wait, that's not working. Crap. Now, for things that are Ethernet connected, um, the way to get them to renew their IP address without it going into like their interface is to just unplug Ethernet from the back of them for a second or two and then plug it back in. That will generally force an Ethernet device to to you know to just because it, it loses its network connection everything's back to zero it gets a network connection back and it's like all right let me reintroduce myself and boom there you go mm -hmm. so but yeah what the heck is up with this webcam trying to like be it's what is it the eye of sauron or something it's like trying to control my life it's like dude just mm -hmm. like i i've turned it off i like having the hector cam i don't use it all that often but it's fun you know and it's nice to be able to use it to test synologies um uh, surveillance station and stuff, which is cool. But yep, yep. what the heck, dude? It's, it's, it's whoa, whoa. All right, that was a good one. Hey, yeah. we learned something. All right. I remind you something. about that. I reminded you about that broadcast yeah. thing. All right, you want to take us to Andrew, John? Andrew, what's what's up with the Andrew? Oh, I know what's up with the Andrew. Okay, well, dude, this is an easy one. No, good. actually, it wasn't. <laughs> so, um, so he says hi, hi, um. If I wanted to use an iPad Pro at work as my primary computer and I needed to connect to a server where the workplace stores and shares files, what is the best way to accomplish this with an iPad Pro? Wow. At first, I was scratching my head over that. So I'm like, because the thing is, as, as you may know, iOS doesn't really have, really give you direct access to a file system. Or network servers, right. right? There is no finder on iOS. You can't say, Correct. well, connect to this. So at first I thought, well, hey, you just, uh, you know, in, um, you know, in Mac OS, you could go to the finder, go menu and say, connect to server yeah. uh, or command K and type in something like AFP colon slash slash and the IP address of the server or SMB or whatever protocol. And actually I tried that and that does not work on iOS. It works on, 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 on the Mac. Uh, or from Safari, you can do that too. In Safari, if you type, you know, the protocol colon slash slash and the IP address, that'll then hand it off to the finder and say, hey, you want to connect to this? Yep. Dude, I found the bee's knees. Now, I've never really had a need to do this before. So, so one suggestion would be, well, maybe you could store it in a cloud service, but then that probably isn't the right way to go about it. Sure. But dude, I found this app. Oh my gosh. It's the greatest all right. I'm, and, I'm waiting. My breath is uh, baited. And I think this would help you with the problem that you have, Dave. Um, there's a free little app in the app store called File Explorer from Skyjo's Company Limited. Okay. You fire this thing up and it's like, okay, um, would you like to connect to a Mac OS 10 server or a Windows server or a Linux Unix server or a NAS or a time capsule what? or a WD, Toshiba, WebDAV, FTP? Oh, dude. So you see in this app here? Yeah. The screenshot should get across what this does. Exactly. And so I, I'm like, wow, I never heard of this app before. So I download the app and I punched in, you know, so I said Windows and I uh, typed in you know, uh, I gave it the IP address of my Synology, the username, password, and lo and behold, it appears on my folders and stuff. Okay, so it lets you access the files, all right? So that's that's one part of the puzzle. But will it let? But then what? I mean, you know, yeah. Are you gonna are you gonna edit them in place or whatever? Well, you could, but then here's the other thing that it does um, that helps uh, complete the job. You can download files from 
your NAS. Uh, Two, it, it creates its own little file system. So like I, I downloaded a graphic and then it's stored it in a folder accessible from within the app um, called Downloads. So it has a few folders. So, so it creates a file system or maybe it just... So I don't know if they're breaking any... Well, they're not breaking any rules because otherwise they wouldn't be in the app store. But um, it allows you to... And it also lets you access your cloud services. Wow. So That's pretty cool, man. That, so I think what you were saying that you wanted to do before you wanted to take a picture and, and get it somewhere else. Yeah. Um, this this uh, little app should be able to do it for you. Yeah, because it'll mm-hmm. see my photo library as a it, it does. It shows your photo library as a um, as a as a store. My problem was I had a I had a photo and I wanted to share it to Dropbox uh, so that I could share the link with. I, actually, I just wanted to share it with the people in the chat room. So. um so I, you know, was trying from the photos app to share to Dropbox and it doesn't appear there. I had to launch Dropbox and do it really. And then Dropbox was like, I don't have access to your photo library. I'm like, yeah, I know. And yep. so then I had to go through a whole other. I, I messaged it to myself and then just dragged it into my Dropbox on my Mac was actually what I did. Yep. Yeah. So this um, looks great, though. There's so a the, pro version. I'm trying to figure out what the difference is between File I'll Explorer tell you. and File Explorer well, I'll tell Pro. You. Awesome. You want me to tell you? Yeah. Well, I think uh, well, as far as I could tell very quickly. So, yeah. So they so the initial app is free. And right. The, the limitation with the free app is that you can only have a single network connection at a time. So the ah. pro version, which you got to you got to pony up four ninety nine. Yeah. Which, Wow. I mean, hey, <laughs> that, that's short money for what we're talking about here. But I yeah. believe the, the pro version gives you the ability to be connected to numerous to multiple file servers at the same time. And I think it also supports playback of a wider range. Uh, Got it. Of, that makes uh, sense. Media files. Yeah. Wow. So, huh? Yeah. Because at first my response would be, well, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily be using an iPad pro as... <laughs> Right, right. As your main computer in a workplace, because uh, my humble opinion, it's it's probably not the best option. But uh, yeah. using something Fe- like this, Federico would like- disagree with you, man. So you oh, know. yeah, yeah. But looking at looking at the availability of this app, since the OS doesn't do it, uh, this app should be able to let you connect to your server and 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 store your you know store the stuff locally, edit it. I I would imagine you could upload. Yeah, duh. You know, it accesses the standard uh, share sheet. Um, right, right. It'll let you access the share sheet. So uh, that's pretty cool, man. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Nice so find. I don't know if uh, he, you know, I don't know if they just access stuff that's already available in iOS. Yeah, probably. Or use some open source stuff to, yeah. you know, do the SMB and, you know. Um, someone else, uh, Kiwi Graham in the chat room, also reminded us of Goodreader. Not quite the interface that you're talking about with this here, but. Goodreader is one of those apps that kind of does everything uh, with iOS that you could possibly imagine. It's it's not really built to do it, you know, this way, but it's kind of how it works. So we'll put a link to that in, too. I think File Explorer is far closer to what you're you're looking for. But if you already happen to have Goodreader, it might serve this purpose for you, too. So it's worth it's it always worth a mention in these these kinds of scenarios. So. Yeah, man, that's pretty crazy. I like it. All right, let's, um, we've got a few minutes left. Our shows have been, been trending towards the hour and a half mark, and I'm, I'm trying to not let that happen. But uh, I, I, when we started this 12 years ago, 45 minutes was the number. Then it nudged to an hour, and then an hour and 15, and now an hour and a half. I'm, I'm shooting back for an hour and 15, John. So... Uh, but I think we got time for at least a quick one. And this is a good follow up from Todd from last week's show. Todd says uh, you recently discussed the new Lima Ultra and didn't sound particularly impressed, especially when compared to Synology and others, uh, which is almost the same in the price range. But a possible possible advantage to Lima might be storing the photo library from the Mac Photos app. Um, we've discussed in the past that the photos app requires its library to be on an HFS plus formatted drive, uh, which can't be done with a normal NAS, uh, unless you're using iSCSI, but, uh, the photos library is also supposed to be stored on a local drive, not a network drive. Obviously Lima is actually a network drive, but didn't you say it appears to the Mac as a local drive? What do you think about this? So yeah, it Lima uses a technology called OS 10 fuse to 
uh, to make this network store appear as a local drive. But the problem is it does not appear as an as an HFS plus file system. It appears as format general file system OS X fuse. And anyway, I tried it. I figured what's the harm. I, I went to create a new photos library and uh, pointed it at the Lima and photos summarily crashed uh, or it didn't crash. But it uh, oh, no, it, it said it unexpectedly errored out when it was creating the um, the the new photos library. Um, I, I, I disagreed. It wasn't all that unexpected. I kind of expected it. But uh, but nonetheless, it won't do it because it, because the file system doesn't exist. Uh, it doesn't match HFS plus. So but it's a good idea. It's good thinking. I, I think there's like I said last week, the Lima is um, it's it's solid. It just it's just feature starved. So it's a I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes. But if they can get the price down, that would be a, a key. Thoughts on this, John? No. No. All right. You know, I, I will simply point you to uh, an article that uh, Jeff Butts and I wrote this week about um, the Apple's new file system, APFS. We talked about it on TDO as well, but um, you can, you can if you have Sierra, you can format a disk as APFS. It won't mount on anything other than Sierra, which is, isn't a great surprise, but it will mount on Sierra Disk speed test with Blackmagic showed that uh, APFS is about 20% slower for both reads and writes on an SSD than, um, than, than HFS plus. And that's including HFS plus encrypted. Now it's not released or ready for prime time yet. So maybe that's the reason, but Jeff also did some testing with his iPhone and found similar results. So, uh, so your mileage may vary, but, uh, but it's worth keeping an eye on this and there, and there might be other benefits, you know, the other benefits to APFS might be enough that, that this particular, you know, sort of bulk speed reduction um, doesn't really, you know, doesn't stop you from, from using it. So anyway, just figured I'd throw that out there. Did you see those, John? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of surprising unless um, speed was not, their primary design goal. Right, right, exactly. I mean, there could be still be debugging hooks in it or whatever that are slowing it down and and okay, fine. But, you know, it it's it's not it's with bulk data transfers. So, you know, big files, one gig to five gigs in size, reading and writing back and forth all the time. Uh, but it's possible it's faster with smaller file stuff and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's it's worth it it I mean there may be good, re even if what we're seeing is the final build of APFS, there there's probably enough uh, incentive to move to it anyway, even though for this one thing, it happens to be uh, fall short of HFS plus. So, yeah, it's interesting stuff, though. Don't you think? I yeah, think so. I mean, uh, I mean, currently, uh, this my my disk throughput now that I'm uh, on the SSD train is not something that usually gets in my way that's the thing right L giving up 20 percent of that is sort of irrelevant um for me too you know I, I i guess if you're someone who does a lot of video editing then maybe you would i mean you would do that on an external drive anyway and maybe in that case it makes sense to format an hfs plus and just do it there so i don't know that's my thoughts if you have thoughts on this or really anything else, give us an email. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. What he said was feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I did say feedback at MacGeekGab.com, except if you are a premium listener. And if you are a premium listener, well, then you get to email premium at MacGeekGab.com. And as we started last week... This week, I'm going to do the same thing, and we're going to give a shout out to all of those premium listeners whose contributions came in during the last week. Uh, for those of you that uh, contributed before this, we'll catch you up uh, um, as time moves forward. But uh, but this is just how we're how we're doing it. And of course, like we said last week, we're wide open to uh, your suggestions and thoughts and comments and all that. So there's a lot of you this week. Uh, let's see. We had monthly uh, people on the monthly ten dollar a month plan. Uh, Dave C, Michael P, Chris F, Elizabeth B, Michael L, Bob P, and Jason A. Thank you all very, very much for uh, for your contribution and your help in keeping MGG going. On the uh, every six month plan, 
Uh, 25 bucks every six months. We have James H., James C., Keith K., Roger Y., Randy B., Robert R., Sharon F., Frank K., Michelle D., Ulysses B., Mario Z., thank you to all of you. And then we had some one-time contributions come in this week. Uh, at the $100 level, Joseph BP, Simon C., Sandra H., you all rock. At the $50 level, David G., and Lawrence H., you rock. And uh, 25 is uh, Frank R. So thank you, really, you folks, like we said last week, you all rock. Thank you so much for doing uh, what you do to help keep things rolling here. All of you, any of you, you premium folks, and anyone else, you're all welcome to call us, 224-888-GEEK, which is 4335. One more way. John, what's your favorite way? What do you want to tell them about? I like the Twitters myself. There it's just full of fun and games. And uh, if you'd like to get involved in fun and games on Twitter, um, twitter.com and I am John F. Braun. He is Dave Hamilton. The show is Mac Geek Gap. The publication is Mac Observer. And that guy flying all over the place to help stimulate the economy. (laughs) And just because he likes flying, is Pilot Pete. Our thanks to Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. And then the podcast marketplace includes... All our sponsors, of course, we mentioned uh, Smile at TextExpander.com slash Geek, Blue Apron at BlueApron.com slash MGG, Harry's at Harry's.com slash MGG, Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, and Barebones Software at Barebones.com. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to you. Thanks to everybody who contributes and sends in questions and all that great stuff. You all rock. Sometimes it's just how it works. Right, John? What's that thing we like to say? Oh, what was that for? I pressed the wrong button, John. You know what happened? I started, I'm, I'm doing all the wrong things. What's that thing we like to say? Don't, don't get caught.